Right. So if you haven't downloaded the notebook for today's today's session, please do uh, from Classum. And uh, let's begin then. So as I said this Tuesday, we will be doing a bit of a practice on basic ML, basic machine learning, using scikit-learn mostly. So scikit-learn. So before we move into move on to PyTorch, which is purely deep learning library, which does autograd for you. Um, we're gonna just you know be fam get familiarized on basic machine learning and scikit learn. We're, you're gonna because even if you do research on deep learning, you're still gonna use scikit learn from time to time. So it's a, it's a pretty probably a good idea to get get yourself familiarized to scikit learn. And uh, some of the things that we learned this Tuesday, like overfitting, underfitting, regularization, those kind of things can be easily checked on using scikit learn. So we'll be doing that today. So. Some of the very basics. Uh, so today's practice topics are data plotting, generating samples, regression. So the regression, and when we're doing regression, we can do, uh, we can check overfitting, underfitting, how the model behaves as we increase, um, how the model's performance, you know, degrades or increases or improves or degrades, you know, when, uh, as we increase or decrease the capacity of the model. So we, if you remember the polynomial thing, so if we use higher order polynomial function, it is, you know, it tends to overfit, but gets a perfect training, training, a training error. So we can check that. And then we're going to move on to classification. After we're done with regression, we're going to move on to classification using uh, iris data. So, oops, shouldn't have done that. All right. So some of the things that we're going to load, uh, import today, NumPy, Metplotlib, and then Scalar. By the way, you don't need to get GPUs for this. Just, you know, just plain CPU resources is okay. Right, we're good to go. So some of the things, the uh, preliminary things, this just tells you how to plot things. So you should get familiarized with, because we're going to plot a lot of things today. We're going to, we're going to train a function and then we're going to plot it and then see if it actually fits well to the ground truth. So please get familiarized. Metplotlib here, Metplotlib, especially PyPlot, which is usually called, which, which is usually imported as PLT, is a very, very nice set of you know, it provides a lot of APIs for you to draw things, not just scatter plot, you know, bar chart, pie chart, whichever chart you you can think of as all probably it's already there. But the most the most basic thing you can do is uh, draw a plot. So here plot is line plot usually. So it could be we're drawing one, two, three, three to one. So it's a, like a decreasing plot. And then scatter is actually in scattering just the dots on, on the on the surface. So we define three dots here, one, two, three, three to one. So it's one comma three, two comma two, three comma one. So three dots. So you see three dots here. And the plot is the line that goes through these three dots. So one, one by three, two by two, three by one, three comma one. And then you just simply call the function show and then you'll get to see this. And the draw plot is something that I just came up with. It's, I just wrote for for convenience so because we're going to use we're going to draw plots on overlapping plots on the same surf same plane because we're gonna um we're gonna compare between functions to see if how they how they uh behave so you can see that uh i go through a, you this function goes through a for loop so for loop over the length of x so it x should be a uh, x should be a like a uh, x should be a list so x and y should be a list and then x sample y sample are just simply uh, dots for the drawing scatter plot so you can you'll see some of the samples below how it behaves so move on then now so some of the very very easy stuff so we define a function which is third order polynomial so you can see that it's x to the power of three uh, uh multiplied to multiplied by the coefficient two over seven so, and then, so it, you know, this a third order polynomial function, and then x line. So lin space is actually it's a it's pretty uh, convenient function. So let's see what happens here. So lin space is usually used for drawing plots a lot, or actually uh, trying to 
visualize the behavior of a function. So X line, what, what, what is X line? We can see X line. So you can see that X line is, X line is just simply a hundred, a hundred dimensional vector, one dimensional vector that spans from zero to 10, zero to 10. That, that is why we call it zero, 10, 100. So this is the beginning, this is the end, and this is how many points we want between the beginning and the end. So we are going to feed this vector into a function, which is the foo function. We're going to feed this vector into a function, and then what do we get? We will get the y corresponding y's, so 100 different y values, right? So let's do that then. Draw a function, foo, using x line. I just said, I just actually gave you all the answer. So Maybe, maybe maybe a minute. Actually, not even a minute, probably. Yeah. So I just said that we're going to feed x line into the function of foo, right? So we're going to get so that we can get a lot of y's. So simply just this, right? And then what we're going to do. So we can actually print y line before we even visualize, see what happens. And see, so... Uh, you can actually imagine how it will behave. It's a third, third order polynomial function with a minus at the front. So it's going to be like, 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 like this, right? Uh, this would be, well, is it, is it correct? Actually, no, it will be the other, it, it, it'll be like this, like this. No, I'm sorry. Well, actually, yeah. So we start from the positive and then we go through, we go to the negative. So it's going to be like this, right? And uh, how, would we, how do we visualize? We're going to use the plot function. So the plot function right here. So we're going to use that. So plt, uh, plt dot plot, plot um, x line and y line, right? And then we're going to call, what do we call? We call this one, plt show, oops, plt, plt show. Then we get this function here. So, right, it looks like like, like this, uh, like this. So this is how this is the very basic way to just visualize any function you want. You define a function, and then you define a bunch of x's that you're going to feed into the function, typically using lin space, and then you get a output corresponding output y, and then you just use call you just call the plot function, and then you just visualize, and that's it. So. Let's move on to the next one then. So far, so good, right? This is very easy stuff. So far, so good. So the qu next quiz. So sample five points of foo in the domain zero to, ten, zero to 10 and visualize with draw plot. So draw plot is the function that we just defined here, right? So sample five points of foo in the domain of zero to 10 and visualize. So how are, you, how, how are we going to do that? Yeah, I'll give you guys one minute. You're going to have to, um, we said that we're going to sample, so we should use, actually, I'm just going to give you a pointer. So instead of using lin space to 0, 10, 5, that's actually not sampling. That is, you know, because if you call 0, 10, 5, it'll be exactly uh, evenly spaced between the samples. So if x sample was np that lin space, 0, 10, 5, I'm going to erase this now. And print example. Oops, sorry. Forgot the comma here. So they're evenly spaced. So it's not much of a, like a sampling, right? So when we sample, you we, we typically use a uniform function. So we call random.uniform. And uh, uh, I think it's the same deal here. It's the starting point, ending point, five samples. To see what happens. Yeah, so this is what we get. So 3.58, 3.01, 3, 3, 3, 1.2, 7.6, 6.6. So, and as we sample again and again, we get different values, you can see. 
So this is a function that we want to use, np random uniform. And then actually I gave you away the answer. So we, we just get the y sample as foo x sample. And then we visualize, but we're going to have to use the draw plot function. So what was the uh, definition? We get x and y, x sample, y sample. So we already did this. Oh, actually, I shouldn't have. All right, I'm going to just, I still need the x line and y line so that I can put them in x line, y line, and x sample, y sample. So x should be a list, y should be a list, x sample, y sample. So I think it's okay. X line, y line, sample, y, y sample. Right. Okay. So it's working okay. So you can see that. So the plot, the, the line plot, or actually the curve, is drawn thanks to the, the this two, x line and y line. And the five dots, five dots are drawn thanks to this two. So that is what draw plot does. So we can actually draw more line. If we put more lines here, like x prime line, or actually the like z line, or actually the a line, and if we had a line and b line. If we had a line, bit, then there will be another line somewhere over here, but dot, dots, the five dots will be still here. So you can, we'll see how we're going to use it. The couple cells below. And if we do run, call this again, the dots will be in the different places. If you call this again, again, the dots will be in the different places. So far, so good, right? Okay, the next one, I'm really not going to tell you tell you guys because uh, this already has a pretty good and pretty good uh, guideline. It says Gaussian noise. So sample five points from foo. Uh, some five, five points of foo in the domain zero to ten. It's the same deal, zero to ten, with Gaussian noise, where uh, the distribution of the Gaussian distribution uses the parameter mu equals zero and sigma equals zero point one, and visualize. So you you guys pretty have a pretty good idea what kind of function to use. You shouldn't use random uniform, right? Yep, exactly. You should use random normal, right? Right. So as this oops. right. As Min Dokti and Yun Che Sok said that we're going to use random NP random normal with the same parameters, 0, 10. Five, actually, no, not 0, 10, 5. So we should use, there are some other parameters that we should use. So, well, well it's probably probably a good idea to look at the API. So num, numpy, numpy API. And search the uh, numpy, np, no, random normal. Right. So what? Wait, wait. What were here? Location, scale, and size. So location, scale, and size. So we are going to have to sample five points. Actually, there that there. This was kind of quick trick trick question because X sample. Well, I mean, X sample shouldn't be here. I, that was my mistake. What you do is you sample, you sample, you sample from the the space zero to ten with the same uniform distribution. But what you do is you add Gaussian noise. Sorry about this. So there, this this was noise. So you add Gaussian noise. So, for example, we can sample from NP that random uniform, or it could be from Lin space actually. But we're just going to stick to the principle zero ten five. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like like Doctor Chair said. So example. And then y sample is what we're what we're aiming for is actually foo x sample plus np random normal and zero zero point one. We're just gonna just gonna clarify. So what was what were then lo lock location and scale? So location scale 
and the size equals five. So before we actually do this, let's see what, what kind of value we, we get. Just going to comment it out. See what happens if we call this. So what we do is, what we're doing is we're drawing five samples from normal distribution, which has the mu of zero and scale, which is sigma, sigma 0 0.1, and five elements from it. So we get five dimensional vector. And what we're doing is we're going to add that to the Y sample. So without this, without, without sorry. Without the second term, without without the without this term, it's the same deal. It's the same deal as before, right? Same deal as before. But what we want to do is we want to sample from a Gaussian noise. So we want to perturb the output y values are slightly a little bit using a Gaussian distribution. So that is why we add here random normal five samples from random normal, which is Gaussian distribution. And let's see what happens. Draw. I'm just gonna copy paste that place. Draw plot. And then you can see there's, well, actually the scale is probably too small. Maybe increase it a little bit. Then you can see that the, now, I mean, we don't need to add noise to the X coordinate because X coordinate is just X coordinate. What we want to, where we want to add the noise to is the output, which are the Y values. So you can see that now X is right here and the Y should have been right on this plot, right on this, this line here. But now we've added as a little bit of noise. Now it's like deviating a little bit from, from the ground truth line here. And as we scale, as we increase the scale, you will see, you can imagine what would happen. You know, the noise would increase. Oh, then if we go for 10, then yeah, like real, a lot of noise. So probably may, maybe one is a bit more easy to deal with. Right, and there was a question. Very good question. All right, we can move on then. So, so far, so good. So this is just sampling, you know, calling some uh, using lin space and random uniform and random normal. And we're going, you can imagine what we're going to do. We're going to generate a lot of dots, a lot of, a lot of uh, samples from this line, the ground truth line with some noise. And then we're, going, we're going to use that, use those dots as a training sample for training our linear regression, or actually it should be not linear because it should, you know that you know that the ground truth line is a third order poly, polynomial function. So we should use a polynomial regression, but we'll get to that anyway. Right, so linear regression. So linear regression is all here. So we could actually go for SK learn API. And then look for linear regression. And I guess it's somewhere in here. Linear models, right here. Linear model, inside linear model, there is linear regression. So you go for that, right here, right? Linear model, linear regression. So that is what we're importing here. From linear model, we're importing linear regression. And typical usage is somewhere here. It's right here. So. You first call NumPy and then SKLearn linear regression, the, the required libraries. And then what we do is we define a we define a, a training sample. I think in this example, they're using four points, 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 2.2, 2.3. And then uh, what are they what are they doing here? They're NP dot. They're doing a actually it's common to doubt, but I guess it was supposed to be some kind of a function, and then they do a uh, inner product between the two. 
and then they so basically they okay so i see so y is a basically y is a output x is an input y is an output and then you do a linear regression and the way you train your model is actually call a api called fit so here what we're doing in this our example is we first instantiate a class linear regression there's a linear regression class and then we instantiate it with lr okay. i'm going to have to okay i'm going to have to mute everybody right we instantiate it and then we train and we train it so we call the fit function if you go for the fit function if you look for the fit function here you have, you you simply provide x and y and that's it you simply provide x and y and then you can there are some other uh optional things you can do but we're going to ignore it for now so fit is training and linear regression can be actually solved analytically so there's an analytical linear algebraic linear algebraic function that you can use but if you if you've gone through like very basic ml you, you you'll know what i'm talking about right so we've defined x sample and y sample five lines five i mean sorry five dots here so five dots uniform y sample, x sample y sample they look like this one two three four five five dots and then we're going to provide them into the fit function and you can see that there's something weird going on here so y sample is given as is but x sample well if if anybody remembers what we're doing here like we're using the none anybody any anybody willing to take uh answer or you know answer the question why we're doing this like we already have x sample and y sample x sample is five dimensional element five dimensional vector y sample is a five dimensional vector we're all good to go but here we're doing something weird i mean no right here weird with the none any reason anybody know reason why we're doing this add one dimension exactly adding extra dimension that is the right answer why are we adding extra dimension we can actually see what happens if we don't add the extra dimension the good thing about coding is that you, is, you know trial trial out is free it's like you're not losing anything so see what happens error so fit so there's some error here why is it an error we're expecting a 2d array so we're do, expecting a two-dimensional tensor or two-dimensional numpy array because if you go here x should be a matrix it should be a matrix usually if you think about what how we do how we prepare our training samples for machine learning we treat our input as a matrix you know each row is a each row is an independent sample and each column is a feature so usually we don't use just one feature for doing machine learning we use multiple features so it, that is why the fit function is is expecting x to be a matrix so that is why we increase one dimension to make it into a matrix right now x sample is a vector it's a one-dimensional array so hopefully everybody gets it I, just just to make it just to make sure i'm just going to print out what what it looks like print x sample and then print right so x sample is a one dimensional i mean five dimensional 1d array x none the second one here it has two it's two dimensional array it's a matrix where each row has only one element so there's only one column if you remember all the different operators see the shape is five by one obviously the shape of this would be five it's five is so it's basically one dimensional array this is two dimensional array with five rows and one column so you can see the difference and that is why we need to and that is how we provide or feed a matrix into the fit function and then obviously it'll be fit it'll, it'll be trained intern internally and then what we want to do is we probably want to visualize first uh, there are some other things like uh r2 r squared is a coefficient of determination we can actually look at what it means this is how we evaluate the performance of a regression function so coefficient of determination or we call it like uh we call it r squared score so here r squared score is defined like this so it's a where one minus ss residual ss uh total so ss total is like how 
the total sum of squares, so it's total variance. And then SS residual is sum of residual sum of squares. So y uh, bar, I mean, y bar is, is a mean of y, right? So y bar is an average. So we take, so this is a mean, uh, this is basically a variance, right? Variance. And then this is how the model, how exact, how accurate the model is for each point. So yi is the i output, fi is the y, fi, so, sorry, yi is the ground truth i, ith ground truth, and fi is ith prediction. And we're, we're basically just, you know, uh, calculating the squared error. And we're doing a, uh, proportion of, of between those two, the SS resonance and SS tot, and then one minus. So, so, so the maximum score you can get is one. So that means that there is zero error. If, if your numerator is zero, then it will, the, this term will go to zero and then your R squared will be one, which is perfect score, right? And, uh, you can see what, what, what would happen if, what you're doing, if what your function is doing is basically just hitting the average all the time, if it's hitting the average all the time, then fi will be y bar all the time. And then the, these two will be the same. So it'll be one and then one minus one is zero. So r squared is zero. So which, which means that your function is simply just hitting the average all the time. So you want to go at least at least beyond zero. You want to get as close to po as close as possible to r squared score of one. So this is, and uh, well, here, L, let's see. Well, actually, I, I guess I have to explain what score function is. If you go to LR score, here the score. Score, what is it? What does it do? It cal calculates coefficient of determination, exactly. So R, So if you call this function score, then it calculates R squared for you. So you don't have to code this, code this, your, uh, code this uh, by yourself. So you just simply call the score function and you get the R2. And what we provide into score function is the same thing. We provide a matrix and the ground truth, and then we print out. So uh, let's see what happens. So did we get the printout? Actually, no. Oh, here. Okay, so we got the printout. So R squared 0 0.9. So it's a it's actually not a bad score because uh, you can imagine why would we why a simple linear regression would get a such a high score because probably the dots. Uh, luckily, the dots do look like uh, a linear. It was drawn from a linear function. So the x sample, y sample happen to look like it was drawn. They were drawn from a linear function. So that is why even even if when we fit a linear function, it gets a pretty good R2, R squared score, 0 0.92. I said that one was a maximum. So let's actually try out a little differently, some other sample. Maybe, yeah, we would like, let's actually, one, one more time. Yeah, this also looks like a linear function. Yeah, this one, okay, so this one looks like a proper, Nonlinear. They were drawn from a nonlinear function, and then we're going to use them here. The same x sample and y sample from the previous. The good thing about so, if anybody's anybody's not really familiar with Jupyter Notebook, the good thing about Jupyter Notebook is, is that anything that you did in the previous cell, it is remember the is it is on the memory, so you can reuse them in the next cell without actually having to declare them all over again. So we're just going to reuse x sample and y sample defined from this cell here and then we're going to plot reuse them right here and we're going to fit it again and you will you can see yeah the r squared is, has now decreased from 92 to 6 basically 0 0.6 because now the samples look like they were drawn from a nonlinear function so what's happening here so after that after so this will be our evaluation metric instead of using mean squared error we can use mean squared error actually but before that we're going to use r squared uh, score. And now we're predicting a single data point. So what we're doing is y hat equals lr predict x sample zero. And we're running into an error probably because we this predict function is expecting a matrix. So if we go to the predict function, predict function, it is expecting a matrix. So and we simply just fed, this is probably a what? This is a scalar because x sample is a five dimensional vector and we're taking the first element. So that would be a scalar. So what we want to do instead is try to, oops, sorry, try to turn this into a what? 
into a 2D, uh, 2D matrix. And oh, we need to print out what I have. So let's see what the actual Y value is. Y sample zero and compared to that, what our Y hat is. So the actual Y, oh, sorry, the predicted, no, 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 sorry, Y sample. So actually just make it clear. The true values of Y were like this. They, they actually contain some noise because we're drawing samples from the function with some added noise. So Y sample is, uh, it contains a bit of noise. So uh, their values are 30, minus four, seven, minus one, four. And the predicted value from our linear regression function be, uh, is like this, like this. And you can see that the first element, 30, so, so it's supposed to be 30, but now our regression function, uh, uh, why hat, uh, something's wrong here. Why is that? Oh, okay, sorry. We wanted to we wanted to predict for a single data point. I forgot to do that. So maybe we should have done this. Okay, so this is still yeah. This is not a two D matrix. Okay, so I guess predict the predict function is always expecting a two D matrix. So uh, what I should have done is, if we wanted to sample, if we wanted to predict for a single uh, element, we we had to we we pick the one, and then that will be a vector, and then we have to. Uh, we have to make it into something like this. Yeah, okay, so what we're doing is we're uh, turning a sample into a matrix. We select the first row, and then we're turning that row into, again, matrix. So it will be like one by one matrix, shape one by one, which is probably a bad idea anyway. All right, I'm just gonna do this. So, so we're just simply comparing between the two. So Y hat and Y sample. Actually, I'm not really sure how we can get values like this with our linear regression function. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. So they should have been, I'm sorry, our linear, yeah, okay. That I, um, because they're random uniform, X sample are not sorted. That is probably why. Okay, so I'm going to print. X example. Okay, maybe I should have sorted them before. So let's sort X sample. Is it that sort? Does it work? Yeah, it works. Okay, X sample, and then our Y sample should be sorted. X if as long as X sample is sorted, X sample is sorted, and our Y sample would be. Uh, it's still weird. Uh, oh, sorry. Why we should have gone for Y hat? Right. So now, now that X sample is sorted, Y sample you can see that they are linearly um, decreasing. Are they decreasing? I think they're decreasing. Hmm. Interesting. I thought that the fit function would behave like this but now that you see here it is behaving in a different manner so while so before actually we start we imagining things we can actually visualize them so please visual uh, well actually there are two quizzes one is calculating the mean squared error using x sample and y sample so forget about all these forget about okay just to make sure just let okay i'm sorry this i'm going to make things really simple by turning this into a lin space In the space five, and the y sample will be exactly the same thing. So we'll have five dots here, one, two, three, four, five dots, evenly spaced. Then they're already sorted because we're calling from lin space. So x x sample is sorted, so our y sample sorted according to the x sample's uh, order. And then we're going to train linear regression function, and then right, and then uh, now, yeah, now they're working probably correctly. So let's use these uh, X sample. Uh, we're going to use X sample, Y sample, Y hat, and then we're going to calculate mean squared error using X sample, Y sample. 
and y hat, which is basically well, the quiz says use LR predict, but LR predict is we 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 actually did LR predict and to store their values in y hat. So you all you need are these three elements to calculate mean squared error. Well, let's do this. I'm going to give you guys maybe two minutes. Two minutes, yeah, two minutes. Hopefully everybody knows what mean squared error is, right? Well, if you don't know, you can look it up on the internet. It is right here. Mean squared error. Yeah, you probably don't, if you look at this, you probably don't even need X sample anyway. So what is the mean squared error? So I hope everybody's using LinSpace because if you had, so we can check, check our answers together. If we were using NP random uniform, then everybody would have different X samples and Y samples, so we can't compare. So pre, please use LinSpace 0.10.5. Uh, oh, actually, I guess because of this randomness, our MSCs would be a bit different. Actually, there's a way we can control this because um, I guess I forgot to mention this. Um, any random function in NumPy is governed by something called NP random random seed. I'm not sure if it's the same random seed. Random. What are the difference between the two? Random state seed. Oh, this is going to be a legacy function. Okay, so it's probably not a good idea. Right, if we use random seed, this is also a legacy function. I'm not sure. So, what's the like, modern way to do this? Oh. Never knew Rand random numpy random c. Okay. Yeah, it is random c. I'm not sure why they call it a legacy function. Anyway, there's a way we can. Oh, actually, there's already an answer from Wang using name. And P dot mean, well, we can actually copy paste that. NP mean y hat minus y sample times y hat minus y sample. Yeah, okay, I guess that's a good answer. Uh yeah, okay, so instead of calling, instead of doing one, one over, instead of dividing them by n, you're just call, simply calling them, calling the mean function. That's, that's cool, okay, that's okay. Uh, we can actually reduce the space by doing this. So uh, stars, asterisk, asterisk two is, you know, power of two. So let's print out what it means. So 58, so actually let's try out. So I'm not, uh, there's a random function here. So, and this random function's behavior is governed by something called random seed. So we can set the random seed here to some, uh, Brian Wong says 200. We can try that. So Brian said uh, random seed 200. And then we got the new set of X sample and Y sample. And then, well, X sample would be the same. And then we're doing a 
we calculated the MSE here, and it happens to be 47.64. Brian, did you get the same number? Did everybody get the same number, 47.646? Cool, okay, so the random seed does work, all right. So we can actually go through this, all these examples and compare our answers together. Cool. All right, so far, so good. So NP mean, we, you can actually do this by, you know, um, a bit sum and then one over divided by one over five, which is, which happens to be X example. Well, sum MSC equals sum uh, divided by X samples size. Oh, sorry, something's wrong here. Um, right. Invalid syntax, why is that? Because probably I forgot a parenthesis here. Not working, int object is not callable. Okay, so it's because of size. Um, print sample size. And all these syntaxes always, you know, getting confused. Example. What, what does it mean? Why is it why is it an integer? Oh, I'm sorry. This is like okay, so stupid mistake on my part. <laughs> yeah, and then you print MSC. Then you get 47.646. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. So yeah, talking in All right, so the moving on to the next question. Use X line and X line we X line which we defined right way over here X line, so use X line and LR predict and draw plot to visualize the linear regression model in comparison with the original function of foo. So you have to draw two plots: the original function of foo and our prediction, which is based on our really trained linear regression. And then we're going to use draw plot, draw plot to do it. So I'll give you guys one minute. For starters, we're going to have to define a new Y line. All right, let's try it together. Um, as I said, we so we already have Y line, which is here. We already have a Y line, and we want a new Y line that we that we that is based on the linear regression that we just trained, right? So uh, we need a new Y line. We're gonna call that Y pred line. Pred line is simply just lr dot predict x line, and x line needs to be a matrix, right? So hopefully this works. And then, oops, what we do is we draw plot, draw plot with two and x sample, y sample. And we put x line here and x line here. We put y line here and y pred line here and see if it works. All right, it does work. Okay, cool. So what we're doing is we're Putting, as I said, we have, we're using a list as an argument in the draw plot function because we want to draw multiple plots at the same time in the same, on the same plane. So what we're doing is we're providing X coordinates for the first, X coordinates for the second plot, Y coordinates for the first, and Y coordinates for the second plot. So you can see that the original function is blue and then the, the linear regression the linear regression function that we just fitted was uh, the orange, and you can see that it is missing by a lot. There's like a lot of error here, a lot of error here, small, very small error here, a lot small here. 
So it, it is doing a, like its best to fit a five points that were provided, which is probably impossible because five points were drawn from third order polynomial function. And all we are using is first order function. So there's no way the fun first order function can properly do its job. All right, so that's why we move on to a polynomial regression. So the way that polynomial regression works in sklearn is there is no separate polynomial regression library. Like, you know, like there's linear regression library in sklearn, but in sklearn there is no polynomial regression library. What you do is you actually um, convert your features into a polynomial form and then train linear regression on top of it, which is basically the same deal. The, so hopefully everybody understands. You convert your feature into, into a higher order polynomial, higher order space using polynomial function. And then, then your features will be a polynomial feature. Then you fit a linear regression on top of it. So that is how you achieve polynomial regression in the setting of sklearn. So that is why we borrow or we, we import something called polynomial features. So polynomial features, what, what, what does it do? We can go look it up. Polynomial features. Polynomial feature is, it, it just as it says, it's generating polynomial features. So given some features, given some or, or original features, you define how much, how, how many, the order of polynomial that you want it to be. And then you, uh, then the polynomial features function will actually convert your given features into that prefer that the desired polynomial order. So we're going to use that to try out second order, third order, fourth order, fifth order, sixth order polynomial functions to fit the five points here. So we start with degree two. So we call instantiate a poly polynomial uh, class, polynomial features with degree two, and we're going to hold it poly. And then here we do fit transform. So fit transform is, go. we go here, we see what fit transform is right here fit to data then transform it so fit transform transformers well this is not the, that transformer fit transformer which is the polynomial transformer to x and y with optional parameters fit, fit params well we can forget what the fit params and then we get a returned transform version of x which is the now it'll be a second order polynomial function so let's see what happens actually when we call this let's see what happens so the original x sample and compare that with Oops. Example poly, see what happens. Now, the originally, originally what example, well, I'm gonna call this in, in a proper matrix form. So what happens? Originally, x, each x sample, individual sample was one, it was a scalar value. It's just x coordinate, zero, x coordinate, 2.55, 7.510. And look what happened now. So because we're, 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 increasing the, we're increasing the order of polynomial order uh, of the x's. So we're actually blowing it up in scale. So you can see that the first order is always one because this is x power to the power of zero, x to the power of one, and x to the power of two. And so you can see the corresponding values. So these are obviously all ones here because they're x to the power of zero. This is the same deal as before, x to the power of one. Now it's a uh, squared values. 2.5 pi, 2.5 is 6.255, 25, 7.5, 56 by 25, 10, 100. So you can see what's happening here, right? So that is what polynomial feature does for you. So we have now we now have a polynomial features and we're going to use them to train a linear regression, which would basically be a polynomial regression in, in, na in nature. So you can see we call linear regression, we're, gonna, we're not going to instantiate it separately now. We call linear regression fit, and instead of providing x sample, we're, not, well, we're now providing x sample poly with the same output y sample and see what happens. So hopefully this is all clear for everybody. We can actually increase the order of order to three and see what happens. Oops, that's a typo here. Now there should be four, so x to the power of three. To the power of three, so five becoming 125, 10 becoming 1,000, so it's working correctly. But well, let's start with two first, and then C. So visualize polynomial regression function comparison with foo. So it's the same deal. Draw, use draw plot 
to visualize the new linear, well, this should be a polynomial regression, PR. So please try out yourself. I'm going to give you guys one minute. All right, we can do it together if you still haven't figured it out. So we want to use PR predict first because we want to, we want, we're, visual, we're comparing between the true function and the, the train function. So what, so PR predict, PR, PR line, PR predict, uh, X sample poly. And we have the true, the true line is still Y line, right? So we are going to just call draw plot. Oops. I'm just going to copy paste this here. Draw line, X line, X line, X line. Let's actually try out three things at the same time. Y pred line and then PR line. Uh, something wrong here. Hundred and five. What have I done wrong? Oh, X sample poly. Sorry, yeah, this should have been X line. X line. Actually, can we do X line here? Because polynomial function is now uh, is now expecting a second order polynomial input. So. Probably we need to transform uh, X line. No, actually, we can actually try it out, see what happens. X line, X line, X line. Uh, PR line, white red line, PR line. Actually, what, what is, what am I doing it wrong here? Before we draw the plot, we can actually see what happens in PR line. Print PR line. Okay, so something's wrong in here. PR predict. Uh, PR predict X line because it is expected two D already got one D already instead. Oh right, X line should be like this. X is one feature. Yeah, okay. So it is expecting three features. Um, so we need to prepare a separate X line then. So X, P, uh, X polyline equals X polyline. X polyline, we put X line instead and see X polyline and uh, X. X, X poly line line, and then we have PR line, see if it works. And it does work. Okay, cool. So we have a proper PR line now, and then we can use draw plot, X line, X line, X line, and PR line, right? Exactly. Okay, cool. So the orange line here is uh, linear regression. Blue, I, the green line here is second order polynomial function. So it should actually look like, like, like very, 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 uh, uh, sl like, um, very far reaching convex function. So if I, do I have an annotator here? Okay, I do have an annotator. So if I draw, it would look like, 
like this, some, something like this, so like a very, very widely reaching convex function. But it's not actually doing a very good job, though. You can see that it's barely fitting these five points. So it's probably not, not doing a good job. And if you actually, if you're, if you're, you can actually calculate the R, R2 squared, I mean, R squared score, the coefficient of determinant, and see how it is performing. Or you can, you can calculate the NSE, but you can imagine that it's not so much better than the orange line, which is linear regression. So what we're going to do is we're going to increase and decrease the degree of polynomial functions. So uh, if we set it to three, see what happens. I'm just going to not print them out anymore. But now it is showing a perfect fit now. Well, it's not perfect, but it is like almost as good as the real. So uh, you can see that if you remember the Y samples drawn from the true blue uh, or drew or, or original blue function was added with a bit of a noise. So it is that is why the dots are a bit deviating from the true ground truth function blue, blue line here. And inevitably, I mean, it, it is unavoidable for the for our polynomial functions to actually know that there is a noise. So it's, it's just fitting, okay, it's just fitting as is. So it is actually going through all the lines pretty much perfectly, pretty much perfectly. And if we had increased it to four, see what happens. Yeah, same function. So four is okay. Five. Five is deviating a little bit. So five is now, you know, like until four, like fourth order polynomial, the shape looked pretty much similar to the ground truth function blue, right? But now when we go to five, it is now not so much, not as not as similar as before. And if we go to six. Yeah, now it's like deviating by a lot. So you can see the underfitting, overfitting phenomena here. Until if we had used degree of one or two, it was underfitting. If we were, when we were using degree three and four, it was like a perfect fit. Well, I mean, degree three would be perfect, but degree four was acceptable. Degree five was deviating a little bit. Deviate, degree six is now overfitting. You can see that it is trying to hit all the dots, the five dots very, very perfectly. So if you actually calculated NSE, it would be like zero. Or if you calculate the square R squared score, then it would be close to what, like 0 0.99 or something. So it is hitting all the training functions, very, very training samples almost perfectly. And by doing so, it is missing the true function, the blue, true blue function, because the, and it, this is in, inevitable because we actually sample the Y samples, Y values with a bit of a noise. So it is actually trying to hit all the noisy samples. And that is by doing so, it is missing the true ground truth function. And now it'll it'll poorly generalize. For example, if we sampled another, another sample from the ground truth function here, then it is going to miss by this much, this much. Same deal as we go to seven or eight or 10. Now it is like showing a really weird behavior now. This, uh, right. So, as I said, it, as we discussed in the material uh, this this Tuesday, the remedy for the remedy for handling uh, overfitting, there were two solutions. One was regularization. The other was increasing the number of data set, increasing the size of the data set, or increasing the number of samples. So, let's see if actually increasing the number of samples help. And how do we do it? We Sample from, we sample a lot more. Let's sample maybe 50 instead of five. We sample 50 samples. Oops, I think I did something stupid here. All right, just 50, okay. We sample 50 dots instead. Okay, I'm doing something wrong here. Uh, operands could not broadcast okay, the shape. All right, the size should be okay. So we're just gonna sample size 50. Sample size. Sample size. Right, so a lot of sample, a lot more samples than before, but with a bit of noise, you know. And then see what happens here. Now you can see it's working. So like before, when we had only five samples, degree six was already deviating by a lot from 
from the, the blue, the blue fu function, the ground truth function. But now that we have 50 samples, it is almost showing a pretty perfect fit. So in order, when we, when we have 50 samples, in order, to, in order to overfit, we probably need to increase the degree to maybe, I don't know, 50. Right, now it's overfitting. Like degree 50 is probably not a good idea. It's actually behaving really weird. It's behaving worse than before. So maybe 15. Yeah, 15 is, you, you can see a slight deviation now, like very, very slight deviation like around here or around here, but it's show, still showing a pretty good job, right? So that is one way to deal with, uh, deal with uh, overfitting is simply increasing the number of samples. But as I said in Tuesday, not always easy to increase the number of samples because it usually needs human annotation. So we're gonna go back to another solution, which was regularization. So regularization, there were two forms of regularization. There was L2 regularization and there was L1 regularization, if you remember. And we're going to try out L2 instead. And uh, L2 regularization, we can look it up. Uh, actually, it's called ridge regression in regression terms. So ridge, ridge regression. Linear model ridge, okay, we can go look it up. So linear model regression ridge is exactly this. So there's this MSC loss here, and then there's L2 loss here, L2 regularization term here with a coefficient. It's a, it's a control variable for how much you want to penalize your model by regularizing. So you can see exactly what we were looking for. So ridge regression is what we're looking for here. So we're going to call ridge regression, and then we're gonna see if that actually helps our model fit better, like not underfit. So from, oops, from linear, linear model. Was it a linear model? A linear model ridge. Ridge. And then what we're going to do is we're going to, before we draw a plot, we're going to uh, ridge regression equals ridge. What are what are the what are the parameters that we need to be careful about? So, uh, ridge alpha. So all we need is just care about the alpha alpha value, the, the control variable for the penalization. So let's see, uh, ridge alpha equals one point zero, and then we're going to fit it with x uh, sample sample poly y sample. And then our R, R, well, our polyline could be reused anyway. So our uh, R, R line would be, would be PR, create R, 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 R jump predict X poly line. And we're going to, well, we're going to do away with the, the orange line here. We no longer need linear regression. Here line and RR line and see what happens, see if there's any difference. We're still using or degree of six. So see, let's see if our L2 regularization help our model not over, over, overfit. So uh, which one? So the second one is green one. So the second one, so the green, the one that is unpenalized, one without the regularization function is the green line. And you can see when alpha value is one, there's a slight, very slightly it is, better slightly you know the increase well not increase is slightly moving toward the green line is slightly moving towards the blue line so the regularization seems to work but we need to probably increase the power by a lot so 10 so 10 now now it seems to work better so compared to the orange line green line is way more closer to the blue line which is the ground truth so you can see that it is behaving a little bit better than before uh, if we increase it to maybe 50 yeah, it is now doing a pretty good job. I mean, we're, I mean, the function is missing a lot. The green line is missing by a lot in this region here. You can see the difference between the blue and green, but at least here it is showing a pretty good fit. So it's probably way better than using orange line. Like green line is way better solution. So if we, if you, if you're not, if you're in a situation where you can't increase the data set by a lot easily, then probably a good idea to use regularization. But if you increase it by too much, like 100, it's going to behave almost like a like a linear function, like 
still, I mean, it's, there's still a curve, but if you increase it by a thousand, maybe. Okay, so, well, not not pretty much as a linear function, but it is like it behaving in a definitely some lower lower polynomial function. It's definitely not six or six sixth order since since it's six. So this is not a sixth order polynomial function behavior because we are we are like constraining, restricting its movement by a lot by like power of one thousand. So we're you know, as I said, increase the regularization function, regularization term helps you decrease the hypothesis space. So now it's uh, the the room for the green line to move is way more constrained than before. So, um, and what are the best values to use for 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 the trade off for the control for alpha? I mean, there is no there is no clear there is no like definite solution. You have to actually see and how it behaves. And when you have a trained and valid set, you can tune your hyperparameter like alpha values to see if uh, your function fits well to the behaves well against the validation set, and then you fi finalize your model, and then you do the test set, as I said. Right. So every hopefully everybody understands what the underfitting overfitting. You can actually visualize underfitting overfitting right here. All right. Moving on to the classification now. We don't have. We only have twenty minutes to go actually. So we're going to use something called iris data set. Iris data set is a flower data set. Iris data set. Iris data set. Iris data set. So this is what we're going to use. Iris data set consists of not images. They're just a bunch of numbers. It's a multivariate. So there are a lot, a lot of columns. Number of instances, 150. So there are it's uh, when you load it, when you load it, actually what I wanted to do really was download by yourself the iris data set from this website. There should be a link somewhere. Is there a link? Yeah, there's, so yeah, you can download it, data folder. So you can download it. And then I wanted to do a little bit of pre-processing in the data set to load it into matrix form. But since we are running out of time, we're just going to simply call it from uh, sklearn. I think sklearn has... Was it NumPy or a scalar? Like either of those two already contains uh, iris data set. Oh, yeah, it was sklearn. Okay, I'm just going to copy paste it. So instead of doing this, we're just going to simply load it from sklearn. See if it works. So copy paste this, please, in your that in your. I'm just going to put it in the chat chat box. So copy paste this and then load the iris data set. And when you visualize it, and you when you actually print it out, what it looks like, X shape and Y shape. X is a matrix of 150 rows and four columns. Y are, actually we can just simply print out Y. Y is a integer, so it, they are just specifying a category or class. So there are obviously with zero, one, two, there are three classes, three classes of flower actually. Iris is actually a type of flower. Iris is 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 a type of flower. So the task is you're given a some feature for each iris subtype. So iris is a, is a type of flower, and there are three subtypes. I think there are the name of the sub subtypes are there should be a name of the subtypes. Yeah, here iris setosa, iris veris versi color, and iris virginica. So there are three subtypes of iris. So our task is to Classify correctly, given a feature of a, a specific a specific sample, we're going to classify it into either of these three given class, three possible classes. So there are there are actually ordered. Like the first fifty is all setosa, the next fifty is all versicolor, and the last fifty is all virginica. And when we, if we, if we just print out some part of just part, print out the entire X. You can see now that consists of 150 samples, 150 samples, and each oops, 
each sample consists of four columns four columns and each column has a meaning actually if you go to this website each column means like there are four columns so each first column is sepal length sepal with petal length and petal with separi 아마 뭐뭐 암술 수술 뭐 이런 거겠죠 아니면 뭐꽃 받침 떼거나 뭐 페탈은 이제 이 꽃잎이잖아요 페탈은 꽃잎이니까 꽃잎의 길이 그냥 꽃잎의 넓이 이거 이제 아마 뭘려나 꽃받침이네. 꽃받침의 길이, 꽃받침의 넓이. 그러니까 이제 꽃받침과 이제 그 꽃잎의 길이와 넓이를 보고서 이게 이제 세토사냐, 벌시컬러냐, 버지니카냐를 이제 분류하는 그런 작업입니다. So depending depending on the sepal length with petal length with, you're going to classify the given sample whether it is it belongs to setosa, versicolor, or virginica. So it's a three-way classifier. I mean three-way classification. So but originally, as I said, I wanted to do a bit of a pre-processing. Practice here, but we're running out of time, so maybe you can do it on your own time. Right, I'm gonna remove this. So, before we train our classifier, we need to train do a train test split. So, we didn't do it before in the regression because regression we were just playing around with different polynomial functions or linear functions, but now we're doing a proper classification. So, we need to train test, we need to tr split between the train sample and test sample and the the go-to method, go-to API that we use for doing this is usually this one, sklearn train test split. So from the sklearn.model selection, we import this function. Simply, you put x and y, and then you set the test set size to 0 0.20. So this is meaning that I want 20% of the entire training, entire data set to be a test set. So uh, since we have 150, the 20% will be 30. So we are, we're setting 30 samples away as an unseen data set. And here we set the random state to zero. So this is controlling the randomness of your of this of this function here. So we put x and y, and then we get x train, x test, y train, and y test. So x train, x train, and y train would be used for training the classifier. X test and y test would be used for evaluating the classifier. All right. So we run this, and then we're going to use so this is a three-way classifier it's not a binary classification so we're going to have to use a multi-class classifier and the one the one that we're going to use is actually logistic regression so remember that logistic regression is a binary classification model it's a binary classifier but you can generalize it into multi-class setting so if you go to logistic regression Where is logistic? Right here. If you go to logistic regression, you can actually train it for multi-class setting. Where's the fit function? Yeah, here are the fit functions. So Y can be a real like shape. So it means that, uh, uh, sorry, multi, right. It can be set as a multi-class multi-class sample yeah it can be set as a multi-class multinomial setting so here uh i don't yeah right okay so here there are a lot of things you can define when we when you instantiate so a lot of things here multi-class auto over ovr it's a one versus i guess it's one versus rest and multinomial and uh i think when we just simply call this in a logistic regression it just goes for the default setting is is auto default setting is auto so uh if the option is chosen if the option chosen is one versus rest then the binary classification binary problem is fit for each label for a multinomial the loss minim loss minimizes the multinomial loss fit across the entire probability distribution okay so i guess we're going we're going for multinomial usually right so just note i mean if you're interested in all this d details you can read them up in uh, sk learn but here we're just going to let the model decide the best course of action so since there are three classes, hopefully we want the logistic regression to be trained for a three-way classification problem, which will be, which actually does happen. And uh, so you call logistic regression, you set the random state to one, two, three, four. It's not really important, but just because we, so just so that we can compare our answers together, we're going to specify the random state. And then we're going to fit the X using X train and Y train, but you can see that something's weird here. What we're doing is we're using only two features instead of using four features. If we had, if we had this, if we had let this go, then it, we would be using the entire 
120 samples and four features, four columns, but we have, we have set this to two, meaning that we want to use the first two columns only, which are the sample length, and you will see why. So when we train with the entire thing, entire thing, it'll train nicely. There would be no problem. And then we can actually, we, once we've trained it, we need to evaluate it. And the way we evaluate it is you are, there are some functions that we can use. Score. Score. So we can use a score function to see it returns the mean accuracy. All right. So since our samples are overly overall well balanced, there are 50 first class, 50 second classes, and 50 third classes, they're balanced, so we can use accuracy as a good measure. So let's see. Logistic.score x train. Uh sorry, what, what are what, this? Yeah, it's expecting a matrix in a y. X train and y train. The score, oops. We need to print it out. Oh, it is actually being printed it out automatically. So when we use the entire columns, the training accuracy is 0 0.96, 96%. And the test accuracy, we can test it out. Test accuracy is 1.0. Okay, so test accuracy is 1.0. So this is. I mean, this is such an easy, easy task. There are only 150 samples and there are only four columns. And the task is so easy that a simple logistic regression classifier would be, you know, it would perfectly generalize. There's no overfitting at all. Like, this, like you can see that the test, phone, test accuracy is 1.0. So that is why uh, I put this two here using, we're going to use only two columns to see if you can actually down, you know, uh, Cut the cut, cut capacity of the model a little bit. So let's see if what happens here. So first of all, if we use only two columns, the training accuracy would be cut down to eighty five percent instead. Before it was ninety six, right? Now it's eighty five, and moreover, the test phone, test call, test accuracy would be seventy three percent. So. Because we're using a less 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 uh, uh, portion of the inform the entire information, we're actually limiting the capacity of the model. If you remember when the model model was underfitting, the way the solution was, if the model was underfitting, the solution was increasing the number of features or increasing the number of power the co power of the model. And here, what we did is we decreased the number of features using. So that is why we we're intentionally cutting down the capacity of the model and trying to make it underfit so that it doesn't perfectly solve the problem. So that was it. And then we can, uh, well, we're running out of time, but you can, I'm gonna give you guys maybe one minute to one or one minute to uh, define a support vector machine instead of logistic regression. There's support vector machine somewhere in SK Learn and decision tree and do the same thing as calculate the score and see if you can get it. All right, somebody already, Wang yu Nim. so Wang yu Nim has already shared how to import SVM in the chat box. There are actually, I think there are two or three options in SK Learn in importing SK, uh, importing SV, support vector machine. Yeah, there's linear SVC and then there's actual SVM. Wang Yusung Nim has given us a C1 CLF. C. Right. I think that's pretty much accurate. So if you go to SVC, um, SVN, SVC. When you instantiate your class, there are a lot of things you can define. But 
we're going to use linear function for linear. So if you're, if you're familiar with SVM, support vector machines, there's something called kernel tricks, and which is basically increasing the power of your model. But the original, original SVM was defined as a linear model. So we're going to start with a linear model. So the kernel being linear, linear, that is what uh, Wang Yusung, Wang Yusung so kernel being linear is a linear SVM, which is the original SVM. So let's see. I'm going to copy paste from the solution here. Like this. So C is actually, um, what is the C? What does C stand for? C stand for a regularization parameter, proportional C. Yeah, it's a it's a like a, it's a regularization parameter like L two penalty. It's the same thing as what we did with the polynomial regression. There was an L two parameter. So we call we instantiate SVC as support vector classifier, and then we fit it with a Y train, X train, Y train, and then we can calculate the score. But we're going to do it in the next next cell here, next cell here. So fitting was okay. And decision tree is the same deal. If you go to if you go look up decision tree in sklearn, there's decision tree classifier. That's what we're looking for. So you uh, you import decision tree classifier from sklearn tree, and then you uh, instantiate it with. There's a lot of different criteria, like how how you want to train your model and all of those different hyperparameters. But the things that we're interested in is actually max depth, like how that how how deep do you want your tree classifier to be? Like it can be three depth, four depth, five, five depth, and as you increase the depth, it, that is equivalent to increasing the capacity of your of your model. So that is like going up, like increasing the polynomial order of polynomial function. Increasing the depth of your tree classifier is is equivalent to increasing the polynomial po the order of polynomial order of your polynomial function. So I'm just gonna again copy paste it from the previous example. Uh, solution like this. So you import from oops, SK tree decision tree classifier. Since it's long, we're going to use an abbreviation DTC. Max depth. So max depth three being that we want to use tree classifier of depth three, and then we fit again. It's the same. The fitting is is you can see that the the pattern of how to use SK learn is always you instantiate a class with some hyperparameter or the options defined, and then you fit it, and then you train, and then you fit it, and then you score it, or you predict it, and that's it. So we're good to go. We have successfully trained all three, logistic, SVC, and tree, and then here we can calculate the accuracy. And uh, well, I mean, the quiz says calculate the accuracy using predict. So what we want to do is actually, for example, in SVC, we predict with X, X test two, and that would give us the Y preds, Y preds, or Y, Y SVC, and then using Y, there there should be a true Y, Y test, Y test, and minus Y SVC, and then we calculate the mean of it. That would be probably it, if I'm correct. Let's see. SVC predict. Does predict give us the actual class? Perform classification. So right. So for one class, for performing classification, that would give us, before we do this, we can print it out. Print Y SVC. It does give us a, a hard number, one, zero, two. And before that. As logistic regression automatically was converted to a multi-class classifier, so, so did SVC. Support vector machine is also a binary classifier, but just somewhere in the in, in, in this class, it knows how to recognize a multi-class class, classification task because our Y train consists of 0, 1, and 2. So there are at least three classes. So the model, the, the class knows that there are three classes. So it is automatically automatically converted to a multi-class classifier. That is why it's behaving as we want it to be. So well, since we have this, we can print the accuracy, which is minus 0 0.6. That is weird. Okay, so 
I'm not sure why this happened. Uh, um, maybe I should have, oh, sorry. I should have done this instead, equal. And the accuracy is 73%. Let's see if this code is the same as SVC score, which is equivalent to calculating accuracy in another way, X test. X test two, what is this? X test two and Y test. And they're the same thing. It's the same thing. So we can calculate, actually, let's go, let's use score function to calculate everything for logistic and for logistic, logistic and D, was it DTC? No, it was, oh, it was tree, sorry, it was tree. And looking at that, unfortunately, tree doesn't generalize as well as the other two classifiers. Logistic and SVC, they get 73% test error. I mean, 73% test accuracy. Uh, tree, not so much. So it, maybe if we had increased the depth of the tree, would have performed better. No, unfortunately not. So probably something not really uh, friendly. I mean, the maybe the task itself or the data set itself is not very friendly towards the tree classifier. Maybe if we had increased, downsize it to two, it's even worse. When we set the max steps to two, it's 56%. So you could probably meddle with the hyperparameters in the tree classifier to see if it increases for the test performance. But now when we are meddling with max depth only, it doesn't work that well. Right. If we had some time, we could actually visualize with this type of a like a nice vision, try to see the decision boundary actually, because um, we've trained three classifiers, logistic regression, SVM, decision tree. And depending on how, based on how they classify the different uh, different samples using only two columns, which is sample length and sample width. We can see how each sample is classified into different col different classes or different colors. And that is how you visualize a decision boundary. Um, unfortunately, we don't, we're running out of time. So I can actually just copy paste the original uh, the answer code. Before we do that, you can actually go through this phase where you meddle with the hyperparameters, especially with SVC, because here we use kernel linear, but if we, we could have used radial basis function, RBF, then it would be increasing your features into an infinite dimensional space. And that could, that could have increased the performance of your model, if it does. Not really. So because the problem is too constrained, probably not. And we're only using two features. So nothing much, nothing much can happen with, even with the RBF kernel function. But you can try it out with polynomial function, Polynomial. I think there was poly. There was kernel. Yeah, there is poly poly kernel, and then you can use degree to degree to set it to three a third order polynomial kernel support vector machine, and then see if it works. Not so much. Okay, so the problem is too simple, so it doesn't really work with the all the all the different meddling. But you can try it out with a bit more bit more data or a bit more feed number of features and see if it works. Before we end, I'm just going to copy paste this and see, just show you what, what we had in mind if we had some time. Uh, just give me just a second. I'm going to Ignore this. I'm going to copy paste it all here. So you can see what's happening with a logistic function, SVC function, tree function. We're getting the predictions out of them. Y logistic, Y SVC, Y tree. And then we're drawing four subplots, one, two, three, four, with a scatter plot and see what happens. So now you can see that the ground truth should have been like this. So so this is like probably sepal length and this is sepal width, the first two uh, features. And then like the sample here should have been, well, I mean, I can see the code. I can see with, let's just call this like first class, yellow second class, cyan is like third class. So the, like, for example, this, this like, there are some 
second and third, cl sorry, third class is all mixed up in this region. So it is probably impossible for linear classifiers to probably uh, properly correctly classify them. And that's what's happening here. Like logistic regression is simply just drawing a line like this, like one line here, one line here. And the SV SVM, same deal, like one line here, one line here. Uh, decision tree is probably doing a little bit weird. Like there's like cyan here. So it's like drawing a line like, 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 like drawing like line like this because it's a it's a tree classifier. So, but the actual answer is this this. So that is why they're all missing out. Like this is seventy three percent, seventy three percent, sixty percent accuracy because probably a, because of this one, and, and like these here, these like logistic and SVM are behaving in the same way. The decision tree is behaving in a different way. So that is why it's missing out on some samples and test accuracy being sixty percent instead of seventy three percent. Right. Um, so far, I think we've covered probably all the material that we tried tried to cover. This one should have been a, like a like a practice for you guys, but we're running out of time, so I just gave you gave you guys the answer. So hopefully that is okay. Question from Ihehyunnim. IRS data를 홈페이지 다운받아 안돼 디렉토리에 에러가 안 되게 구글 콜 그렇죠 당연히 구글 콜랩에도 업로드 해야 됩니다. 여기 보시면은. 이쪽을 보시면 여기에 여기 폴더가 있잖아요 폴더 폴더를 클릭하면 이런 게 생기고 여기다가 드래그 하면 돼 다운 받으신 데이터를 드래그 하면은 여기 이제 샘플 데이터 안에 여기에는 네, 여기는 없는데 뭐 여기 샘플 데이터 안에 드래그 하시든 어디든 하여튼 드래그를 하시면은 이제 그거 이제 액세스 할수 있게 됩니다 그러면 이제 여기서 예를 들어서 여기에다 액세스 여기다 드랍했다 그러면 이제 거기서 아이리스 데이터를 바로 이제 폴을 할수 있는 거고요. All right, so this is the end of the material today. Uh, any question before we end? So next, starting next week, we're going to move on to PyTorch. So sklearn is probably bye bye from now. So hopefully, because we're not going to delve into sklearn anymore, but sometimes we're going to use sklearn functions as we move on throughout the course so and as i said we're not going to explain all these sklearn details anymore so please be very familiar please just do the practice do the practice session on your own try to go through all the examples and try to play around you know play around with the options and how you how you can draw plots and that kind of stuff and get really familiarized and then we can move on to the pytorch without any further you know uh, uh, obstacles right so i'm gonna wait five seconds before we end All right, no questions. Okay. Thank you guys. I'll see you guys next next Tuesday, right? We're that's after the truth up. So yeah. Happy holidays, everybody. And I'll see you guys next Tuesday. Bye-bye.